this uh, presentation on uh, come out here and uh, please applaud <laughs> for his work on uh, the shortest path with twists and turns congratulations thank you, thank you very much and you will get you know a grant that will deal with uh, the uh, <laughs> prize money all right thank you uh, number two um, was, as I have now learned to call him, Jacob <laughs> Yiddish, um, for his work on visual similarity. And sorry, I still can't pronounce it, but <laughs> congratulations. Thank you very much. And uh, number one and first prize, according to the jury, was uh, Yu Su, uh, based on his work on bridging uh, the gap between lots of data and humans that have to make sense out of it. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. And with that, I'm handing it over to Rich, who's introducing our distinguished speaker. Do you want that mic? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it, it is a tremendous pleasure to introduce to you today our distinguished speaker, David Culler, Dr. David Culler. He uh, received his PhD from MIT. Uh, he's a fellow. Um, of ACM and IEEE. He's a member of the National Academy of Everything, the NAE, uh, National Academy of Engineering, sorry. He's a former chair of the uh, EECS department at UC Berkeley, the former and founding director of Intel Research Berkeley, um, the director of the I4 Energy Center, the current dean of the Division of Data Sciences at UC Berkeley. The number of academic awards he's won requires scientific notation to enumerate, and he's coming off a recently successful tour uh, of the Broadway musical Hamilton. Um, <laughs> that part's not true, actually. I made that up. But don't be surprised next time you hear a bio for David. He is one of the most talented people I have ever met, and it wouldn't surprise me at all to learn that he will be winning a Tony Award soon. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Professor Dean David Culler. Thanks, Rich. I think Rich's job is to embarrass me in all situations. I can, <coughs> um, think. So um, great to be back in Santa Barbara. Um, lots of friends. I haven't had a chance to do this, and I've been busy playing administrator lately. So that also means I've put sort of new set of slides together that I have not a real clear picture on how long. So if I tend to flow over things a little later on, that's OK. Um, the idea was to give you some ideas and let them wash over you a little bit. So um, I've always been um, intrigued in some of the uh, centers, the, the um, Energy Efficiency Center here and whatnot. I, um, I'm going to key this off with the S word. Um, that would be sustainability. And so uh, a bit of um, my background there. So, you know, I came out of a world of network systems design, um, having you know, done clusters and what we now consider the cloud, and then spent a decade or so doing embedded wireless sensor networks. I thought that was all done. And, it, you know, it's kind of amazing. This is a picture from 1999 slide when we understood that in you know about 20 years from then we would have connected all the way from embedded physical devices up to this global computing infrastructure so we're right on schedule more or less um, and when I came back from doing a company and going back into the university, you know, part of the question was why was that? And you know, there's an opportunity to, to really attend to the problems that really matter in the world. And so for me, that was this question of where is the opportunity to bring what we've learned in you know, connecting the world to this question of having a world that we could continue to live in. So how do you get a little handle on that? And so borrow a page from the California Academy of Science uh, around the 2050 sustainability goals. And there was a very nice framing there um, in a, a presentation by the chair of, can we achieve this? Well, technologically, yes, we can. Um, and it's a pretty incredible path that we're on, essentially an order of magnitude reduction in emissions per capita to get to that point. Um, you know, and it's interesting, the scale, yes, 3% uh, of the land mass, you know, that's roughly twice that that's occupied by cities and a, 
and 5% um, of what's occupied by agriculture, but two fundamental limitations. And the one which in theirs is a little uh, hard to parse out, um, we don't have significant technology for load balancing without emissions, what they call zero emission load balancing. What's underneath that, and I'll kind of lay that out, is for a century, we varied the supply of energy to match this time varying demand of using whatever we wanted. And now when mother nature is deciding how much energy is available, at some level we now have to turn that around and you know, make hay when the sunshine adapt the consumption, the load, to match what's available. That's what we call networking. So um, that's been the start of a journey for me. And you know, of course, there's this whole family of increasingly networked systems that form the infrastructure around us that are intrinsically interwoven, whether that's our built environment, that's our transportation environment, our energy environment. So um, how is it that we can really bring the body of knowledge that we've got out of constructing the internet and these families of other networks to apply to some of these societal questions? And I'm really amazed. This is a picture from last year. We'll see how this spring goes that, you know, we actually hit points where 80% of the state's power was coming from renewable sources and people are looking at that and oh my god the bathtub effect and whatnot. So let me try to dig that in a, a little bit and we'll build it out to where is there computer science to do in this. So um, energy systems 101, so the classic view of this is the grid if you will consists of three tiers. Um, supply, transport, and load. And within that, we have this variety of supplies which we modulate and then deliver through a transmission and distribution tier to these things we call loads, which, you know, the motors, the lights, and so forth. And um, we kind of wrap that all up. You might say that's kind of the physical plane of this network. And uh, if, and if you're looking at this kind of from the classical view, well, we have these new fluctuating renewables um, and um, some small amount of um, supply. So what has changed? What's the picture that we need to be thinking of? Well, number one is storage and renewables are not just there, but they're spread through all these tiers. And, oh, by the way, we've left off the most important tier of all completely, which is the purpose of that is not the motor or the light, but the fact that we're actually heating our spaces and cooling. And, you know, it's the consumption, it's the people that, what are we doing with them? And, in effect, our job is to begin to introduce that information plane that goes along with that physical plane and part of why that's so important, if we think about closing the loop between consumption and supply, all of those feedbacks are through that information plane. So if we're ever going to make these two come together, it's going to be because we become part of that, that solution. So that's kind of the, a thinking point of where we began. And as we got started back in 2008, 2010, uh, you know, the first thing we did was collect all of the different kinds of information. So we created something called the simple monitoring and actuation profile that all of these things were stovepipe, grab all of that together. We brought in all of our embedded networks and whatnot, connected everything we could. Um, and this was also interesting because how are we ever going to get to where we can do research in this world where how do you put it in your lab? Well, we have concepts of virtual private networks and whatnot, but if you think about that, if I can measure everything, I can instrument both the fossil sources and those renewable sources. I can begin to instrument all of the loads. I don't actually care if this electron went from here to there, if I can look at the whole balance of those. So I could create, in some sense, a virtual private grid and start to do research about how do we move this, this forward. Okay. And just as a little indicator of that from way back when, 
Um, this was a picture now several years ago of the very, the mix of supplies in the California grid over the course of a year, broken down by all of the underlying pieces there. And part of that message was, it's capturing all of these complex dynamics of you know, these hourly variations like solar, the daily variations in what we do in time of day and night, and the seasonal variations that all of these dynamics are sort of overlaying one another. But if you could capture all of that, you could do a little thought experiment like, what if today we had increased all of the renewables so that they provided 60% of the black line, the consumption that we're using at that point, what would that look like? Well, it wouldn't look anything like any of what we see today, all of these excitements about the crunch that we need demand response for, for the cooling loads in the middle of summer. It looks completely different. That at that point, the, the greed is showing huge excesses in energy at certain parts of the year. The challenge ahead is actually going to be nighttime in the winter time, that everything we think of today about how we view energy is completely different as we're getting into deep penetration. Now, we, when we did this, you know, California was about 8 or 9 percent. We're getting up towards 25 percent. The the world we have ahead of us when we really think of these is really different. So the other thing this did for me is you get, so where is it that all of the electricity was being used? Um, so how did I ever get into buildings? It's like, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. So, you know, it's where we spend 70% of our electricity, about half of our energy and waste. Um, and they don't get up and move around. They're easier than cars. So they're the, the natural counterbalance to these fluctuating renewables. But it's also kind of interesting. Um, you know, what's more, where do we spend all of our money? Our house and our buildings, right? It's where we spend all of our money. It's where we spend essentially all of our time. And we work a lot with folks in the Center for the Built Environment that do human comfort studies, and you know, two-thirds of the occupants are uncomfortable um, essentially 75% of the time. So you know, it's an incredibly low bar at some level of where we ought to. And, and you know, once we build them, then there's absolutely nothing you can do. So you, know, you can think of them as a big, slow robot turned inside out, but they're actually this complicated cyber-physical system in part because of the people inside and the environment and all these things that you don't control. Okay, so the mission that we were on, something called the Software Defined Buildings Project, essentially was how do we make those programmable? What would it mean to create an operating system for the built environment so that you could have the kind of application innovation that we've seen on your smartphones and almost everything else in the world, okay? What would be the set of primitives that you would compose into applications? How do you get some degree of universality? How can you write once and run anywhere? All of those classic questions we could now start to bring for the built environment, which is so heterogeneous. Okay, so we could kind of imagine what this is. We're all familiar with the physical building. Well, some of us more than others. We know what to complain about in the physical building because it never quite works, but it's subsystems. That we can imagine a sort of cyber analog for that. Um, it would have to deal with a bunch of all of those low-level devices and things like we have drivers for in our computer systems, and it would build up a bunch of models. And we would start to think of the building really not just as the interface between the indoor world and the outdoor environment. That's how architects and engineers view it. If I can take the envelope and I do it perfectly, the world outside disappears and I can now opt now. Think of it as kind of your interface to the energy environment and the personal environment so that we can begin to optimize these things together. And then we can imagine all sorts of applications that would yield to that goal. Okay, so that's kind of the thinking where we started. And, and oh yes, if you're serious about that, then security and fault tolerance and resilience and whatnot are just gonna bite you absolutely everywhere. So 
early on, um, we built what we called a, uh, essentially a runtime for the building so we could start playing with some applications. And then we sort of learned it and we built something we could call an operating system. And then we understood a little bit more about multiple applications. And the metric for me in some sense was the hack value. To what extent did students just sort of run off and start building applications? And um, they did. So, you know, that was 2010, 11. We built the personal comfort monitoring on your phone. You could walk in and you could tell the room to give me a blast of cold air. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Of course, we built all of those dashboards and modeling and forecasting and where are you. Um, demand response is the utility word for how is it that you adjust consumption to match. Okay, so uh, we'll talk a bit more about that. We, we certainly did that. Um, our friends on the control side did model predictive control. Well, the first thing you have to do is state identification. So we basically scripted the building so that they could put it through their paces and things like that. Um, personalized environmental lighting, uh, demand controlled ventilation and filtration that says, you know, you, you freshen it up when you need it, um, integrating everything. In fact, um, you get really interesting things. We put heating and cooling down into the furniture, and this gets really interesting because now I can even think about um, a comfort meter that, you know, if you're not adjusting your personal environment, if the collection of you, then it's kind of close, and you have, I can, so, um, uh, in fact, the question of how do I get a building in my lab turned out to be a refrigerator. It's kind of like a building. So um, we got to the point where we had refrigerators that were operating directly out of the renewable um, rate of renewables online. And they're actually a better refrigerator in many ways. Um, this was um, really getting all the way down. Your perception of comfort is not very different than the thermodynamics of what's around you. Um, if it's a little cool in your face. Uh, so you could imagine that once I give you personalized control, the building can actually begin to adapt to comfort rather than some rough metric of temperature. Okay, and of course, the most important load of the building has an in, actually in the building, it's your electric vehicle that's plugged into it. And that gets really interesting because now we're reaching back out into the electric grid through the distribution tier that's absolutely uh, uh, opaque today and nobody really has any idea and it's full of all of these cars that threaten to blow it up and all of these renewables and all of the rest of that. Okay, so where we've ended up and where the sort of tail end of this project, we now understand how to build what we're calling an extensive building operating system, if you will, an operating system for the built environment. And that's got some pieces. Um, the core throughout is a syndication tier. I'll say a little bit more about that, um, which ended up being not just the way to glue it all together, but the way that you really could do authorization and protection across all of these administrative domains. So to give you a quick overview of some of those pieces, I'm going to walk through that, and then what I'm going to do is take three parts and sort of dig further into what we discovered were really interesting computer science challenges, computer systems challenges that were sort of lurking down inside. So to start with kind of that overview, the first piece was the syndication tier, the pub sub bus that glued all of these different pieces together that we kind of backed into to connect all the different subparts of the building as we looked then from the city or the state, that tier of composition integration, not just as how you bring all those pieces together, but how do you protect them? So in this transition, um, everywhere we found, we were always working with delegation across administrative domains. So, you know, here in the university, you could imagine the dean owns the space or that really belongs to the state, but then it gets delegated to the facility manager and you would think that your office would get delegated to you, but no, you can't actually change any of that schedule. You ought to have been delegated to 
control some piece of that. If that was going to engage with the electric grid, then you would like to have some idea that, that that notification coming from the independent system operator was actually authentic. How would you do that? So we found that building that technology into the syndication tier meant you could have some guarantees that I, we, I hadn't seen before. That if I'm going to engage in some communication that's going to cause you to do something, I should present a proof that I'm authorized to do so in a manner that could be verified by the communication substrate and the piece on the, whatever is receiving it on the other end. How do you construct such a proof? How is that across administration outliving any of the vendors? So that's the third part that I'm going to come back to. There was a starting point of just this immense heterogeneity in the physical world. We have a hard time just adjusting to different form factors of screens. So this was all of these different vendors, all of these legacy devices, and increasingly everybody has an, a RESTful API. They're all different. Essentially creating the adapters to lift all that up, put it in a canonical form so that you can start to integrate these things together. We did a bunch of that. Um, once you have it, you can start pounding it out. I'm not going to actually dig into that much further. The underlying subsystems, part of it is everything is time series that you're going to need to make sense out of. So I'm going to dive into some interesting things in time series databases. Um, the power to integrate it all together comes back to representation, comes back to metadata. And where the heck do you get it? And how do you get to where when you author applications, you author them in terms of this kind of semantic tier so that you can drop it into any of these environments. It can do the discovery. It can figure out. So I'm going to say a little bit about that. Um, and uh, then we'll come back and we'll look. Um, so in particular, I want to introduce you to uh, where we got to of uh, this uh, brick proposal. I didn't see myself as a semantic web kind of person. Um, I'm not exactly a zealot for that, uh, but it was this really interesting international journey to get there. And then, of course, you know, all of the analytics and advanced control and whatnot, we can, you know, sort of drop into there to do a whole bunch of things. Okay. So, what I want to do with that kind of framing is take three of these problems and just kind of dive into a little bit about where do we end up going once we started from that, that place, from that context. So um, the first one is this notion of really getting series about time series databases. And uh, we found this early on. Everybody that was in this space, they would grab their um, MySQL or their Postgres, and it worked great for about a week, and it loaded it up, and it actually was terrible for doing any kind of time series and what, okay. Well, so the thing that put, so we built something called ReadingDB early on and did some benchmarking of that. Um, we got involved with a group that was really focused on the power system side that had a new sensor. So uh, there's a thing called a synchrophaser, which is like a fancy electric meter with a timestamp, a GPS. And so in the North American uh, collection of grids, there are 1,700 of these. The point here is it's not that you're measuring power or current. You're measuring the difference in angle of the phase at different parts of the grid. And this is important because these grids bend before they break. And that's sort of what's going on. So, you know, where you're up there in million volts, those are very expensive. Um, there's about 5,000 in China. But um, so there's a new member on the scene, a micro synchrophaser that would be cheap. Um, and part of what was interesting is what you'd like to do now is deploy that throughout the distribution tier where there's no understanding whatsoever, and you might have millions of these, okay? Uh, and it's also interesting because in this space, there's this huge variation in time scale. 
So you're going everywhere from things that are operating in microseconds to, you know, decisions that take decades, okay? So this huge scale. So um, this was fun. We got down inside of all kinds of strange utilities and substations and things like that. It's kind of an interesting place to make wireless work. Um, there exist standards for this. They look like something out of the 70s with glorified modems that are concentrating some data and putting it together and, you know, this horrendous mess. So um, our, so we ended up taking a completely different view of this. And um, part of the notion was, so each of these have about a dozen channels at 100 hertz, so you can think of them as kind of a killer set of samples per second. But the question was, what if we have millions of these? And roughly what ended up being our design goal is about 1,000 per decent processor in the cloud. Okay. How do we get to where something that we could operate at that kind of scale? Um, so that's this piece that I'm going to dig into more. But the other is everything you do here, you have these raw streams coming in. And the whole question is, what are the algorithmics for this? What are the analytics? And people basically had never had any visibility in this data. They really didn't know how to do the analysis. They knew problems, islanding, reverse flow, various. How do we get to where we could support innovation within there? So the rest of what you see around there is um, really constructing the kind of infrastructure that allows you to take these raw, dis raw streams and distill down refined products to where you can do analytics despite the fact that there's all these holes and things are out of order and things come back and somebody changes this and you get data that was sitting there that comes later and all of this stuff that we always ignore ended up driving so much of the design. Okay, so what's underneath here, um, you know, it's really interesting. It's not huge bandwidth but the time precision had to be very accurate, so getting down into kind of nanosecond time precision um, with all of these variations in order and mistake and things, um, all of the, and much of the analysis are gonna end up being aggregates, okay? So how do you get orders of magnitude more than what's been done before? Well, simplify it. So the other side of it is really the only thing that we're ever answering is things about querying over range. The other is um, you're constant, you need to maintain the providence of all of this. So it's about everything as a version. So if you will, the approach that's taken here ends up being really different from designing storage systems. We view it as at every point in time, we have the data for all of time. Well, for a few centuries. It just has some big holes, you know, a particular big hole at the end. And then as the world fills in, times move forward, but you go back and you fix things in the past or you fill in some data or you change some algorithm that that just has to do with filling in holes in different parts of time as versions of this go forward, okay? So, um, Let's see. Um, just to give you a, a sense of what this is. Um, okay, I'm tracking that clock, which has the right hour, but the right minute, but not the right hour. Okay, so this is a little example of um, a substation up at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and something down on Alameda that are maybe 30 miles apart and the kind of question that, that our power systems folks are answering is um, things like, what is the dynamics underneath this voltage sag at two different places so that you can see how the grid is sort of bending between them, okay, as one little application, okay? So um, part of the point is when you start even looking at this data, um, a, a year is about 20 billion points, okay? so. Um, every pixel you're looking at is a few million points, 
Okay, so why am I looking at all of the data to even get there? Okay, so besides focusing on time synchronization, given that I have to maintain all of these versions, so like any versioning file system, it's built as an underlying tree, why don't I build up those statistical aggregates and really build them into the underlying file system? Okay, so what that means is here I'm looking at a statistical summary of data over, um, what do I have there, a month or so. And you can think of that as bin, max, and mean over a slice of a few million points so that if I were to grab that point in the tree, that really is this whole body of data for which I have a statistical aggregate, which if I really wanted to dig in a little, I could see a better picture, which is if I really look at what's there, I can see what's the underlying data that's here, okay? So, and then once I build, okay, so the concept here is the response time of any query is bounded in the size of the answer, not the size of the underlying data. Okay? So given that, what I will do is answer a response at some level of a hierarchy. Um, maybe, actually let me show you, the obvious ver um, use of this might be visualization. So let me, let me give you a sense of how that might look. Um, let me grab this one. Uh, let's see if that works. Okay, so what am I looking at here? Um, I'm looking at, it looks like a few weeks of data from uh, three different phases of a substation that happens to be up at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and you can see there's some variation. There seems to be weeks and weekends, and let's actually spend some time going at. So, um, okay, I actually have a few months of this. Every single one of those data points is about 10 million points, which we could go walk down inside, and you can see it starting to fill in, and of course, I might be, get out of here, what is that? I might be scrolling around in this, and it ought to fill in, and what I ought to do is drop down, we'll see, you know, uh, if I really have connectivity here, I should have tested that. Hmm, well, is this even gonna, will his demo fail? Hmm, you wouldn't, I see, so, oh. Ah, this is, Rich warned me about Eduroam. Oh, you did, you oh so did. Uh, uh, there you go, okay. Well, so much for that. Um, okay, S there, you, hey, it, it was just a minute ago. Okay, um, we'll stick here, that's why we prepared this. Okay, so, um, the other piece of that, so, you know, what's interesting is you have, for all this raw data, you have to take it through all these distillates, and something like this phase angle, di angle difference is actually drawing those from lots of different places. You have to put them on the same time scale and all the rest of it. Just, the, just like you want to have a very quick way of aggregating the data, the most important thing actually is to aggregate what has changed in the data. Okay, so that was another concept completely missing in these kind of things. Okay, so we could dive on down into what are the family of design techniques to build a system like that. I think in interest of time, there's a great fast paper on BitterDB that you can dig in. You know, what did it achieve? Let's try that. So, for example, on four nodes in the cloud, we're pushing 100 million inserts per second. This was only 1,400 times the state of the art. Uh, that's before you get into any of the exponential benefit you get from the statistical aggregation and whatnot. Um, that number, so for example, all of the meters in the nation which give you about a third of a million inserts. Okay, so could you get to the point, um, I could run all of the transmission label synchrophasers on a four-node cluster and I would not be 
you know, 20% of the way, okay? So part of the point if we had done this is, you know, here's the thing, can you look at an aggregation of the world? This is looking at, what, a year of data? If you look down inside that, that looks like there's something, you know, in April, if you look at what's really there, if you look at what, it actually was not one thing, it was really two things. Oh, and those really have structure. And this notion that there's something uh, that was important for about 100 milliseconds somewhere in a year is absolutely routine if you're beginning to understand that. So what that means is you can start doing algorithms where talk about sublinear, let's get logarithmic. So you could ask, for example, what are all the voltage sags over the year? And in that 100 millisecond kind of response time, you could discover that, in fact, there were 11. Okay, and now you can start iterating that in a learning loop to go understand what's there, okay? And doing this in the real world means you discover interesting things that happens about what actually happened inside that utility or that photovoltaic system in, down there in Riverside or what was really going over at the Tennessee Valley Authority and all of these interesting points and, okay. so. Bottom line, after now about five years with some companies stepping in, this is getting out there, you know, all of that old NASB stuff is being replaced with some really state-of-the-art network systems design that takes these ideas and fold them in, and that's pretty cool. And that same multi-resolution search has all sorts of analytics applications in buildings and things like that. We can begin to fold all of that back in. Okay. Little excursion down into that. Let's come back up. So the other one, let's try a different piece of that metadata. Never thought I could get excited about it. Um, so let's take an incredibly simple problem. Um, so in building the notion of a rogue zone, uh, that says no matter how much of the time you pour cooling into that office, it's still too hot or vice versa. And you can imagine, you know, that's a pair of sensors, the set point and the temperature in the same zone. You should be able to write some simple program for it. But it needs to run not just on this building with its particular infrastructure and all the rest of it, but on that building over there and this other one. So how do we get to the point that we could write that once and put it everywhere, okay? So the state of the art in this world is the metadata for a typical commercial building consists of thousands of SCADA tags that were never designed to be parsed by computers. They were the things that the building engineer began to recognize. Okay, so they're redundant and they're context dependent and they're suggestive and they're trying to integrate, so they look like those things. But these folks were not unwise. They actually were building a lot of structure. So if you look at that, for example, part of that says what building it's in. SOD happens to be soda. Part of it said what it was. This is an air handling unit. That's the thing that cools or heats the air down. It tells you which one. It's for a room with this room number you know, which is sort of numeric, except when it's not, and some rooms are corridors, and they start with a C, and then it's the air zone temperature, and then there's some delimiters, but they were just filling up the space, except, okay, so you can't actually parse this. So what's the answer to all things? Machine learning, of course. So we built this whole active learning system where take the, the precious commodity is actually the experts in the buildings. There aren't enough professional service organizations to move the millions of buildings forward. So treat them as precious. And you create kind of this loop where you hand them this piece of gobbledygook and they parse it. And then you take that and you go back and learn and look at all of the thousands of and you give them another one. Okay, so how many examples do you have to present them with before you can get an, an answer? Okay, and the, quickly the answer was things like, you know, just 1% of them or something, you can start to get a real handle. So you could automate a lot of this, okay? Um, 
And part of what you see is that all there may be thousands of them, um, you know, maybe 10% to get them all. But in truth, what you really wanted to use this for was for implementing some application on the building. And a lot of those esoteric one of things you didn't need anyways. But moreover, when you had a few of the tags, you could go back and look at the data, and then you could do machine learning at the data and say, this looks a lot like the rest of your temperature sensors. It just had a different name. And so there's all these things you can do to really streamline this, OK? So a couple dozen or something like that. And then all sorts of things. So you know, then you can suddenly apply it to all of your buildings, and you can identify there's a small number of mechanical problems that if you don't fix, you can forget all of those advanced controls and all the rest of it, so go fix it. And, and the building managers are happy because that's the thing that nobody wanted to pay for that you actually needed to do rather than those fancy commissioning consultants and the rest of that. OK. Um, so, this was pretty interesting because you would say, that's crazy. All of that should have been written down in the first place. It should have been in the designs and all the rest of it. So, and there's all of these standards. Surely you could use one of those. Well, the other is you can say, let's take what the engineers encoded in that gobbledygook as the specification for what would it mean to be expressive enough to describe everything that was useful for them to do in their building? And you could ask, do any of the existing standards do that? OK. Well, so given that we could acquire this stuff automatically, given that we knew how to build applications, from those two things, you could take that and you could establish the set of, of relationships you could do a metric of standards, and you could look at how well they scored in completeness and coverage and flexibility, and the answer was they all failed. So how could these standards ever take hold if they can't even do what people traditionally do today? Okay. So this was a fascinating moment two and a half years ago at the BuildSys conference in Seoul, where we were presenting the good, the bad, and the ugly paper that did this analysis. There was a bunch of other research groups that had developed type inference for various underlying sensors, grabbed pieces of the problem. We had done things on uncovering relationships through the data occupancy. So the question was, all right, do we as a community take this on? Could we go create a metadata standard that would actually pass our own test? So that became this kind of two-year uh, collaboration with a bunch of universities and a handful of companies and whatnot. Part of the point was the existing things are taking pieces of the problem. So let's really get to where the applications and services over all these different buildings with all of these different guts inside, how instead do we build them over a common one? So the result of that was brick. And last week, ASHRAE did put out a press release that they were adopting it. So we're actually making headway. Um, so let me give you just a little tiny bit of that. Um, so the idea here is with a reasonably robust ontology, you can describe all of the things. You can describe all of the relationships. That's a graph. You could start doing queries over that graph, OK? And everything is a triple. It's a subject, a predicate, an object. This relates to, to that. And there is established languages, query language, something like Sparkle. And so you could ask the question in this one, um, give me the temperature in each of the rooms that's part of an HVAC zone, for example. That's sort of what that says. I think I won't take you through that. But you know, more or less, in this case, we have this underlying graph here. And you know, this says it's a room. It's a room in an HVAC zone. Um, uh, it, it's a temperature sensor that's also in a room. And um, <clears throat> so 
I could find the, set of, the temperature sensors in the set of rooms that are also in an HVAC zone, okay? So this was great. We ran it, and the queries took hours. So my grad student, Grabe Fear, I think there may be a database problem underneath this. So what does it need to be? So um, if you think, you know, the classic goal going back to what, the very first time-sharing system, you know, if it's going to be interactive, it needs to respond in 100 milliseconds just like a keystroke, you know, whatnot. So um, what we could do then, so part of the getting together in this group, the ante, was you had to bring a building. So that was the other. It's like the internet, you know, um, general consensus and um, uh, independent implementation. So, you know, it's not the description, it's the, the, the realization. So that way we had a bunch of buildings and we could define a set of actual queries that represented these applications. And of course, what we were benchmarking on was the open source thing that you could all use, but surely there's so many companies. And so, you know, then the next step was to go do the analysis. So this in the Kivia graph, the little a uh, septagon in there is the 100 millisecond, and you can see different technologies. And yes, indeed, the really expensive ones kind of got closer, um, but um, still they were off in many cases by an order of magnitude rather than five. That was great. Um, these kind of graphs look completely different than the social networks on the web that all of those tools were being developed for. So, you know, you work long and hard, and you get to where you can do all of those in far less than, so, you know, three orders of magnitude better than what's out there in the state of the art, at least in this focused domain. Okay. And there's a whole set of techniques down inside that of how do you pre-process all of the data. So you get a tighter representation and you expand out the graph and you keep playing all the tricks you need until you, you get there. Okay. So that got us to the point where this crazy, wacky, surely these pointy-headed academics can't produce another to, it's actually some technology that could be used and start influencing the industry is that we're, we're actually getting somewhere. Okay, so the last one that I wanted to touch on was, that's fine, you've buried a little bit down inside the grid, you've buried a little bit down inside the building. How does this all start to come together into a smart built environment where these different parts of the network could play together. And <clears throat> you're always crossing administrative domains. Um, so this notion of delegation of authorization across completely different administration domains, federating things that are really apart from one another, maintaining, yes, this was shortly after you know, the attack on everybody's baby cam and all the rest. So this denial of service concerns are first and foremost. Um, how do you get to where there's transparency, maybe even auditability in member Enron, right? While at the same time, privacy, how do you get that set of issues? And of course, we like everybody else, we're asking, so what good is blockchains? Um, <laughs> And we've actually been running our own Ethereum chain for three years now and pushed it in all sorts of places. So a bunch of the PRs are actually coming out of this because we're placing it in, okay. So that's this last piece of how do you really secure the higher level infrastructure that's tying all these pieces together in a way where you can compose across different domains, each of those are a namespace. Um, so, in a nutshell, part of this is it's no longer about people who have a login and uh, something that can type a password. It's all of these things and services that those are the principles. So it has to be natural in what they do. Um, uh, if you have a set of rights, you should be able to delegate that to somebody, to anybody, to the thing you leave behind, to the service you create. 
but you can't make any assumption that they're actually in communication. So how do I delegate? You know, before I walked in here, I should have been able to delegate to Rich the ability to do some, you know, this, right. So without assuming anything is online. So the basic idea is that every message carries a proof of author, authorization and authentication. What business do I have putting something on the network without proving that I'm authorized to do so? with no central authority anywhere. So in particular, if you think of OAuth and all of the places, if we're looking at cities, these are gonna outlive any of the vendors that are by any of the parts and services, so it better be distributed over them. Okay, so kind of lifetime. time. Okay, um, so um, basic notion under there, almost anything can be an entity, so therefore it's a public key. But if you actually want to recognize that, so we introduced um, a notion. So once in your life, you could register a string that became the equivalent of a public key. This is a thing you can do with microcontracts. Um, so what's powerful about that is you can sign something. Um, everything in the world is a resource in a namespace that has a structure underneath it that you can tie together. Um, namespaces and then are your representation of your administrative domain. So everything that exists in the future Internet of Things is a namespace and a resource path that represents that thing in the world. Okay? And you can think of what will happen in this world. It's as if you're, a thing is sending messages to another thing in service and associated with the envelope is the proof that you're able to do that, okay? So that ends up being the fundamental unit here is this global delegation of trust where there is in the public record, if you will, every delegation of anything to anything else. Now there's nothing about stating I delegate certain rights to you that says I had those rights in the first place. Certainly, I, how would I go up the chain of command to coordinate that? So the idea is, uh, let's get the, yeah. So if I'm going to, if some entity is going to engage any other anywhere, what it's going to do is prove produce a proof that it's authorized to take that action on that resource. And that, base, that proof consists essentially of demonstrating that there is a path from the owner of the namespace that captures that resource to this entity where the transitive closure of its rights is requisite to do the work. Okay? So... Essentially, there is such a path. So if we think about the network in this world where I have some sensor now that's going to publish a reading that some other device is going to respond to, is subscribe to, when I communicate, I augment, I go and discover my proof in the global delegation of trust. So I attach that to the message so that the router essentially can verify that I'm authorized to do that. So it should be that no device anywhere ever receives any author unauthorized request unless the fabric itself was compromised, which says that every little device out there also needs to be able to verify that proof. But verifying it is just demonstrating that that path is real. It's much easier than discovering it. Okay, so basically that involves building four microcontracts down inside your Ethereum blockchain to capture that set of things, creating aliases, registering entities and namespace and everything else, establishing the, the creation of a dot, and that was it, okay? 
you end up building a lot of structure to that so that you can write applications on top of it. And you can imagine that part of it is I want to delegate to you, for example, everything that's in this building, the California Institute for Energy and the Environment, maybe only the things in the thermostat, maybe only the temperature. OK, so you can put a lot of discipline on top of this. OK, so one of the questions would be, does this scale to something like a city? Do these blockchains that have fixed bandwidth, do they support that? So one example of that was we built an emulation of the city of San Francisco. The thing that is a delegation is a relationship, like buying a house, acquiring an apartment. Um, the players in here is the utility company that has meters in all of these. The delegation here is you own the building, you delegate to the rental agency, which delegates to a property management firm, which delegates to a rental. Okay, those are part of the changes. You have energy services companies that take the notification from the grid. They take the utility, they take the preferences from the occupant, you put them together to have a response. Okay, so that was kind of an interesting picture. You could build up a live world of a few million people with a few million entities, and you could build up what would be the transaction rate over such a blockchain to maintain all of this? And the answer was, it's actually trivial. You could keep up with it just fine. But on the system side, we also wanted to figure out what is the level of denial of service protection that something like this. And we had found that nobody had done any of the performance analysis against blockchains. Um, so we did that. Um, that was sort of interesting because in order to mount attacks, we had to first collude for months to create enough gas to go attack ourselves. Well, it turned out that the best way to do that was the attack was actually load the initial state of this emulation. So this is a little picture looking at what is the bandwidth and computing requirements of such an infrastructure with all sorts of assumptions of network connectivity and the connectivity of such a graph. And the picture you're looking at there is from the transition from normal operation to this attack. Do you ever fall behind and things like that? OK, so that's sort of asking the question, could we have complete transparency in a world where the delegation of trust is auditable? But you might say, even just a resource like Jake's room baby monitor is already revealing. So could you have such a world and also maintain privacy? Can you get to the point where you can cut, construct the proof and the router can verify the proof without actually being able to see? So that created this question about privacy preserving delegations of trust. And with all sorts of tricks and cryptography that I didn't quite fully understand, the answer was you could get to where basically the only thing you could tell is that somebody delegated something to somebody. You could, the destination, in order to work your way back up. So that's a really interesting place of where some of that stuff plays. And if you like, we could take that apart. So. Um, yeah, basically, the guy at the end needs to be able to discover enough, and the act of crawling your way up has to give you the rates to find it, and then you can use that to encrypt it. OK. So where are we? And just to close, um, we have this project with the California Energy Commission to now move this out into a whole bunch of buildings. And so we do things that don't look like what a computer scientist. And there's lots of these buildings. And if you wanted to look at them, you know, they're kind of interesting places like in Avenal. And now you can take a thing like this. Here's the California Institute for Energy and Environment in a time where the energy consumption of a normal day versus a day where there's what's called a critical peak pricing event. So um, in a normal kind of day, that would be the peak of usage. And in the blue, you see that, no, we used some energy in times when it was useful to pre-cool and then allowed it to ride out. And that means 
we now can see enough that we can do all of the kind of advanced control so that you could do other things like really program your way across this. You could do mix of trade-offs between comfort and energy savings or good citizen to the grid so all of the analytics can start to kick in. And, and there's no end to where you can play. There's another student that's been looking at image processing and so if you're building all of this I ought to be able to point my phone at the thermostat and suddenly have an interface to the thing. And the California Energy Commissioners, it blew their mind that you could do this and it was the same. And there's all sorts of other things. We're off building new forms of moats. This is the craziest anemometer you've seen in the world. Um, so, um, let, so we could talk more about that. Okay, so um, to conclude there, so Part of it is an interesting methodology about a virtual grid of living laboratories, and you've got a bunch of them here. Part of it is this whole notion of representing physical information in syndication. Yes, we could build the kind of systems capability that would allow application innovation in the real world. The only way to get there is automated handling of the metadata that actually gave you enough. That's the key to portability. Um, having some evidence base is the only way this will really scale. Um, we can get visibility into all of the tiers of the electric grid, and we actually could have fully distributed authentication and authorization to establish trust. Okay. But since this event is about the graduate students taking control and, you know, what does this all mean? So I wanted to close with one thought on a formula for what the heck is systems research. So mine is, it's really an exercise in time travel. So imagine a technologically plausible future. Create an approximation to that out of technology that exists. And from this discussion, you can see that approximation can be pretty clumsy, but interesting things. And then dive into that deep enough to go do the science, try to discover what's true, how do you correct for the experimental error of the approximation that you've created, doing the quantitative and the analytics, the foundations. Um, and with that, let me say thanks, and let's continue to try to save the world a little bit. Thanks. Do we have questions for David? Mike. Let's come this way. Oh, we have a ringer that had many questions earlier in the day. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, that was really good. Uh, I'm pretty interested in the uh, the usage of blockchain in your uh, boss wave, um, you know, system. So in Santoshi uh, Nakamoto's original paper, the generating time of a block is about 10 minutes. Even though on Ethereum they switch from uh, you know POW to something like POS, uh, you know, proof of stake. The generating time is still quite long in terms of, you know, if yeah. you want to do some authentication, I think yeah. that's, you know, a little bit, a little bit longer than expect. So is the, the speed a concern of, you know, of you for the, for the blockchain integration of your system? Thank you. Yeah, so <clears throat> what actually ends up happening is uh, kind of the reverse of that. So part of what's important here is the changes in the blockchain have to do with the changes in authorization. All actual interaction is, the blockchain is not on the critical path. So none of that actually goes through. None of the communication, none of the messaging. Uh, so what the blockchain does is allow you to establish a proof or verify a proof, okay? So then the question is, if I make a change, uh, how long does it take before that new ability becomes available? That's very different if it's creating a new authorization than it is a revocation. So revocation has to be fast, but 
authorization can take time. So what the change in distributed system design, what the world, you know whether or not you are up to date. Okay, so it changes it from, I can wait until I know that things have settled, or I could take a risk. Okay, and I can bound how long I have to wait because it's whatever the interval is of the blockchain. So that's a very interesting flip in this space. Of we get all of these other properties of, you know, essentially a globally consistent view, but we have these cases where I either know that I don't know and I can wait, or I know the nature of that. There's a bunch of things you do in here to make sure that you do the caching so that you, you can make some of those trade-offs in there. Um, but the other key is it takes time for the authentication to percolate, which is the same thing. You know, you buy a house, it's several weeks before you get the grant deed. Okay, and so you, you arrange that. So that, that is actually natural in a bunch of these, but it wouldn't be if you were using it as the transaction mechanism. So we're actually living um, essentially on the Ethereum blockchain, except that we um, did some of what are called uh, pre-compiled contracts. That gives you a slightly new virtual machine. It would now be possible to do all of it in the actual Ethereum blockchain. But we wanted to explore it. that things are not going the way that you would want to and you need to intervene and make some changes. Uh, do you have that kind of a modeling that is behind the scenes that... Yeah, so um, years ago, Gaetano Borello, we miss him, you know, ran this workshop on invisible computing up there and, and I, I actually managed to get in the Seattle newspaper for a quote, the real world has no alt control delete. So, you know, that's part of the point, that as we move forward into the world that we all say we are going to be a part of, that notion that we have when it's all in our, we, we will never have that. So you have to think entirely in this design space of you're influencing a little part of a thing that's out there. It means that, so this is, you know, part of why much stronger, you know, correctness by construction, if you will, much stronger um, resilience has to be just sort of a natural part of, of the design. Um, so, um, no, you don't get to call it all back. I mean, this was one of the bizarre things living in this, I mean, we built our own blockchain. We had to conclude with ourselves. Um, you know, there's lots of places where that shows up. Some of them are traditional, what we do for RAS and whatnot. Um, but even something as simple as um, you're pushing the building to operate in an advanced control setting, um, you lose communication that was coordinating parts, okay? So you need to fall back to traditional building operating system. So we built that notion, you know, everything was a lease, you know, you have a safe fallback. Well. When you fall back to that controller, it finds itself in a part of the state space that it's never supposed to be in. It says, oh my God, right? So then it's, so we actually had to do the equivalent of slewing, so you transition gracefully back to the low-grade control regime. So there's a bunch of those kind of classic engineering questions that have to be a natural part of the system design. So it would be it would be great to to uh, entertain ourselves at David's expense for the next couple of hours. But I think what we'd like to do now is transition to uh, uh, a fireside chat format. But before that, uh, Matthew, I think, will be presenting. This is we're going to warm it up since we actually managed to get a cold, rainy day in Santa Barbara. <laughs> there we go. All right. So on behalf of the Department of Computer Science, um, we'll stand over here. I uh, wanted to thank you for coming down to Santa Barbara, to your hometown, um, Santa Barbara High School graduate here, by the way. 
Um, so hopefully it wasn't I, too bad to come down here. That's almost true. You didn't I, graduate? I didn't graduate. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, wow, scandal, scandal right here. You heard it. Um, anyway, we appreciate uh, uh, letting, uh, you letting us pick your brain all day and have a bunch of meetings and with students and EVCs and, and all kinds of people. So thanks and, and for a wonderful talk. Um, so I wanted to give you a little token of appreciation, which is um, not, uh, basically saying uh, that we appreciate your distinguished lecture. So let, let William take a quick uh, little picture of us. And um, thank you. So. Goes on the Twitter feed, right, William? <laughs> So as, as Rich mentioned, the, the last part here and, and then after this last part, the, there still will be um, social time and I think some uh, food and beverages out there, but is uh, intended to be for a very informal fireside chat uh, with David that uh, Professor Rachel Lynn, sorry? Yeah, well, yeah, put some fire up there. Um, <laughs> that Rachel will lead, so I'll, I'll uh, let yeah, Rachel so take I it away. Actually yeah, we can sit down. You get to sit down finally. You totally deserve it. And what I would like you actually to invite people to come maybe sit a little bit closer to the podium because it's supposed to be really informal and then we will just have a conversation about David. And uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I think it's mostly uh, my questions are just like threads that I think you can take my question and go wherever you want to talk about. Okay? All right, so brought him in and gave him an excuse to leave. <laughs> oh, I asked you guys to come forward, not to come <laughs> Okay, yeah, great. So, as uh, Matthew has already said, is that you grew up in Santa Barbara. And in fact, a uh, very nice anecdote I want to share is that your father um, is that your Glenn Keller is actually was a faculty member of, uh, at UCSB in the mathematics department. And he actually was one of the person who helped to, to form computer science in this university. So this is really wonderful. So can you share with us some memorable moments uh, that you have with ah, Santa Barbara and UCSB? <laughs> <There we have. laughs> now we have um, the fire. So um, the early days of computing here were amazingly excited. So I, I saw it literally from a little kid's point of view. Um, I can remember what's now, I guess, Engineering One. It was the only one um, um, showing at the lab. And the grad students were so excited about a new key to build keyboards out of. <laughs> OK, so I mean, in those days, this was punching cards, and they were doing interactive online computer classrooms. So the reason that the ARPANET actually got started, why was Santa Barbara part of it, was because there was this thing called the online system running here on a IBM 360 that was a unique resource in the world. And how is it that other places, Harvard in particular, could get access to a unique computing resource which was actually being used for mathematics education. So nothing was taken for granted. I mean, we didn't have what we call monitors today. Those were Tektronics storage display scopes with raster graphics to do character displays and things. So, you know, um, Everything was so close to impossible that, you know, everything was. Um, I can remember one of the graduate students, they wanted to um, automate uh, writing on the chalkboard. So they built this whole apparatus, kind of like what you see over in Dos Pueblos High, to hold a piece of chalk that would go and do script on the board, which turns out to be really hard. So, I mean, all sorts of things were a part of it. Um, so he was in electrical engineering and math because there was no computer science and director of the computer center because that's where computing was happened. So um, which meant that, you know, what bigger pinnacle of authority? So we forget that in 67, the black students union took over the computer center and the chancellor said, well, that's Colors Computer Center 
let him worry about it. So he did, and he found that he completely agreed with all of the students. In, and, you know, so what's the problem here? So um, it was a very interesting time for, for this university, um, and interesting politically. I mean, Isla Vista was annexed to Bakersfield. That's what you do if you want to limit the political expression that you, <laughs> right, you amortize it. So it, it was a really interesting and unusual time for, you know, computing to take place. Interesting story, I didn't know. <laughs> okay, so then after you left Santa Barbara, did you just go directly to UC Berkeley for your undergrad? No, um, so um, I did admit I didn't graduate, that was true, but in those days um, it wasn't so hard to get into the university. Um, so when I decided that I was going to go to college, you know, it was already January, yes, and, and Berkeley was closed, San Diego was still open, so I applied there, and my sister was going there, and a friend too, so um, I went there for a couple of years. Um, and. Um, everybody was stoned. It was kind of boring, I figured, so I transferred to Berkeley a couple of years in. Um, you wanted to be more political. Um, maybe. I mean, the, the waves were nice, but the surfers were really mean. I mean, you know. <clears throat> so nobody felt at home there. You know, coming from Santa Barbara, it didn't feel that. So, you know, if you're going to go where things were really happening, it seemed like maybe there was more happening at Berkeley. So did you, uh, were you decided, were you doing computer science at Berkeley? Oh no, I never, um, I only had one computer science class as an undergrad, um, and that was logic design. <laughs> and so, and then I got a job here in Santa Barbara as a logic designer, um, got to build, um, uh, I guess the first, signal processing processor for doing digital speech. So that was interesting. Many of you will remember Roger Wood, who was another. So uh, his son and I, David Wood, spent the summer, uh, this would be 79, building digital signal processing. Um, he had had the architecture course, so he got to do the hard parts and, you know. Um, so, yeah, I didn't, um, uh, I didn't, so, Given my kind of peculiar background, I could put myself through school programming and doing other things. And of course, that was in when tuition was $238 a quarter. So that was an easier task. Um, so, um, so whereas you could take all of these other courses. Um, and for me, I remember I had, it was just after graduation, and I had graduated as a math major at Berkeley. And um, I had already got the prelim exams, so I would catch up. This was how I admit what a nerd I was. And I was taking the bus out to visit my uncle in Davis, who's so, we have not not far from UC. And I was thinking, all my life I've been studying mathematics and I'm up to 300 years ago. <laughs> I think in my life, maybe more will happen in this computing thing than in mathematics, and that was the shift. Um, I went off, I, and that process, I got a job uh, writing the Cray timesharing system for what was then the Magnetic Fusion Energy Computer Center. Um, I spent a couple of years doing that, and it, it has seemed like there had to be a much better way of representing parallelism, and so therefore I went to MIT to do data flow because that was going to be the answer to all possible questions in parallel computing. Yes, Klaus smiles. <laughs> and Torsten, yeah. And it's still true, it's just a really lousy instruction set, but we're all doing data flow all over again. We just call it lambda, and and it's just at a slightly higher level, and it was right, sort of. That's an amazing story. I did not know that at all. <laughs> Completely running off my script. That's okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's come back. <laughs> so back then, it was a very different world. Did you envision that computing would become like what it is today? So I guess that goes back to your first question. So um, what? 
Glenn's view, and part of what was driving what happened here, was this view that computing was enabling human creativity. So, you know, this is in 62, 63, where it's punching cards. So, um, you know, what we really didn't anticipate was what that would mean when the world was connected. I think we did sort of anticipate what it might mean for, you know, these capabilities to, to be there. So, you know, at some level, yes. Um, you know, the craziness we see around us, you know, we clearly, so what was it? December 2016, we crossed that boundary of half the world's population connected. Okay, so we're at 54, 56% something now. We really failed to understand whether or not we as a society were prepared for that. Clearly the answer was no. Right? So I'll come back but to that. But we the cannot go back. <laughs> so we better figure out how to get prepared. Yeah. I'll come back to that point a bit later. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I do want to ask that uh, over the years you have been very successful and you have found many different passion and many different areas to work in. And have there been very difficult moments and how did you get over it? I think that's very relevant for the young audience. They, yeah. yeah. So we had a little uh, discussion of this earlier. In, so um, uh, I often find myself expressing, I, I'm not really a very good computer scientist. I'm kind of a mutt. I don't seem to fit very naturally in the mold, but some of the things I do seem to have some utility in the world. So um, what is underneath there is almost everything I've done that's been important was met with sound rejection. It's seldom fatal. Um, well, maybe at the, maybe the data flow stuff at least had its zealots. At least at MIT, there it was going to save the world. Uh, maybe there was rejection from Berkeley and other places, but we overcame that. Um, so um, you should expect, you know, don't let rejection hold you back. Um, so we, you, Rich mentioned the Intel Berkeley lab. That, that was interesting. So that got started in 2001, and a lot of the sensor network work came out of that. And uh, there was this thing called Planet Lab, where we connected a few hundred universities throughout the world. All of the papers on all of that were either rejected or grudgingly accepted, um, because surely this wasn't real research, and you know. So it was really interesting in 2013, where there's time for those t tests of time. We got a dozen test of time awards <laughs> on papers that. So um, I heard Amin Vidat speak recently about his. WebOS paper, the operating system for the web. And I tried to draw him out because I knew that we had got that rejected four times. He filled in, actually, we never got the paper accepted. <laughs> what happened was one of the program chairs decided to invite it to HPCA since they... Um, I heard this amazing talk by Shafi Goldwasser on all of the rejection she received for the public key stuff. So, you know, it's a really interesting thing. We work so hard to get academic freedom and then we get so wrapped up on this approval thing that we don't necessarily do the thing. So that would be my measure. It's a little hard to differentiate. Is it getting rejected because it's really kind of lousy or because it's really important and they don't understand? So, you know, okay, that's hard to, but, um, so I now look forward to a little bit of rejection, maybe even a lot of rejection. Yeah, it was, uh, I did hear about Shafi and Silvio talking about their earlier work on public encryption as mm -hmm. well as zero knowledge, how yeah. many times it was rejected, mm -hmm. and eventually they got a Turing Award yeah, for it. That's exactly <laughs> right. So I don't know, I've been, maybe there's, I haven't ever said this publicly. Um, I thought it would be fun to do a site of our very best rejected papers. 
Yeah. And um, to include in that the reviews. <laughs> and I think it would be a fascinating body of work and create some really interesting discussions around it. But Yeah, so now I do want to come back because we went a little bit over time, so I'll try not to uh, go too much longer. But let's come back to this point that sometimes science advances and maybe the society is not ready for it. And mm. now you're spearheading the new data science division at Berkeley, and we're seeing this wave of data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence just coming to us at yep. very rapid speed, maybe even faster than how the internet is developing. And how do you think we should shape it? And are we ready for it? And what are the challenges and opportunities? Nice question. <laughs> so, so um, you know, in some ways, um, I'm actually kind of optimistic here. So, um, the, the ability to formulate conclusions, formulate expression, you know, we've had this ability in prose, we've had this ability in art to, to you know, have an expressive medium. So the thing that I'm most proud of in what we've done, you know, in building this program up in Berkeley was this sense of empowerment that students have got because they can build the arguments and make them sound. It's essentially give them a new form of expression. So that is immense. Um, there's no question that, and this is also part of why it's so important that we're not just consumers, but really producers. It's not just the analyses and, and fluff that we're seeing out there. I, I do think that this whole body of awareness around, well, let's, let's take bias in learning algorithms, for example. This is a really interesting one in that, you know, so much of that is, it is amplifying glaring biases in the underlying society. Okay, so, you know, we can blame the bias and, and we should, but, you know, it's also exposing these really deep things. And part of what's interesting, part of why I think it's so important for universities, and I mean universities, not just vocational schools and, and technical schools, is because there are these really deep questions underneath about purpose and, and, and ethics and morals and whatnot, and, and where we really do need to be engaging in, in that part of the conversation. But there's also beautiful foundational work. So Morris Hart, for example, has really looked very deeply at this question of the nature. And you get the equivalent of completeness results or incompleteness results in questions of fairness and bias. That, for example, under the assumption that there's an underlying inequity in the population you're observing, you can either have recall parity or equal opportunity, but not both. So what do we even mean by fair? You know, or, you know, these really deep questions. So, I, you know, I, yes, it's moving quickly. Yes, it's clear there's so much going on in media and communication. On the other hand, the ability for people to empower themselves to you know, actually check that and draw, I'm, I'm actually really optimistic in, in that side. And I, you know, I think what we're seeing in the generation of new students coming out, it's not just the 17 year olds that say, yes, you're right. And on November, I will be voting. That was a pretty amazing thing last week. But students coming through the universities that say, and I can make a stronger argument than you because I have the tools to to really do it, I think, is, is really, really important. Yeah, it does sound like this is connecting back to what you were saying when students were doing the punch cards and then they were having the new express medium to kind of show their creativity. Do you think this is going to be a revolution as much as <laughs> <laughs> back so in the days when computer came out? Oh, I think it's much bigger than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, and it's not because it's also about the world of connectivity and the digitalization of so much of life. I mean, I think we're 25 years into 
something that is, you know, we, we talk about the printing press and enlightenment, you know, we talk about the industrial revolution. We are living through a societal change that is so, it's easily as transformative of those. So, I mean, I, yeah, you could say it really started 60 years ago as we started bringing computing in, but I think it's, it's much bigger than I mean, the, the fact that it's connecting so deeply into our lives. Um, and then you can wonder what do students do with it. So, you know, anecdote from data eight, um, you know, they understand how to sample from a distribution. We publish our grade different distribution. They can go compute the expected grade differential of different faculty teaching the same course. And they can do whatever they want with that decision. You know, there's just so many basic questions that with a, you know, modicum of tools, you actually can get a handle on things that have a lot of uncertainty about them. But, so, yeah, um, we've got to do it well. We've got to do it with our eyes open. Right. Uh, so one last question I want to ask is, given that our technology is changing so fast, how can the university classes sort of catch up, given that we're kind mm. of in this university mm. setting, and we have many faculties down there, and this is a question yeah. that's been bothering us. Yeah. yeah. Um, rely more heavily on the students. Um, I think that's actually the only way is to create a culture of students being very much a part of the institutional elements and, and its pedagogy, because that's the only thing that can keep up with them. Um, and what's really interesting is that means placing a degree of trust. And, um, you know, we've, we've tended to focus on the transcript more than the individual. Um, but, um, I mean, we've gone through this crazy explosion. Um, I've been amazed at the degree of leadership that our current students not only naturally build up, but then um, actually live up to. Um, so I, I think that's an untapped resource that in some sense is the only way to keep up with the pace of change. Yeah, but so beyond the scale, but there's also in terms of the content. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, clearly that the computer science curriculum cannot change at the speed of the technology, but to some extent it has to, how can they catch up or do we need to do anything to catch yeah, up? Yeah, so um, that's one, you know, if we take stock of how have we kept up, I mean, okay, I'll just look at our own computer science curriculum. I think we have fallen incredibly far. And the principles are all still there. But um, I got, I filled in for some faculty teaching the operating systems course this week. And, you know, we had software handling of a TLB fault. Yeah, that's what's important. <laughs> right? We're still teaching elevator algorithms for disk head management. What's a disk? <laughs> right? I mean, I think there's an, it's a, we, I mean, we don't even teach Android per se. No, I, um, I think that if we actually look back on ourselves, we say we allowed ourselves to fall pretty far behind. Mm -hmm. And we're unusual because we have some notion that, you know, as a, bachelor's, master's, PhD, how many years behind the state of the art are you? Or ahead, right? That would actually be, this is an easy metric in worlds that are sort of constant. Um, I think we would all find it a little unnerving to see where we are. Yeah. Okay, so I think we already run out of time, but I do want to say if anyone in the audience have a bold question to ask to David, Please do that. Even a not so bold question. <laughs> I set the bar too high, yeah. <laughs> yeah. John was all, oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, that just, that, that so broke my heart. So, um, three years ago, my graduate group was half women. And I put those pictures together, and it broke my heart that 
um, okay, I should be happy they graduated. Um, but, um, and, you know, then you have really inspiring people. So Shankari there, um, she left her professional life at VMware as a successful professional to come back to the university to get a PhD. You know, so she says to the other graduate students, I left the job you're looking for in order to do what you're doing now. Um, but, you know, she's focused on sustainability, and that's really hard. So, um, yeah, um, we've got a long ways to go. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you noticed. Um, I, I didn't have the pictures, and when I did, it was, uh, yeah. But we did grad student recruiting last week, and I had... 10 students come talk to me and, and I had, that was reflective of the world. So, you know, we'll see, but yeah, um, it's huge. Um, this is also one of the things that's really um, different in the, so in the data science space, you know, um, our introductory courses is more than 50% women. Um, this question of how to really reach out to all segments of society is really, really hard. Um, but we don't have to create the same mistakes this time. Uh, the other message I would say, um, and some may read the Academy report on the growth in computer science, if you look at it historically, every time there's been a boom in enrollment to which Universities have now placed constraints, additional requirements and whatnot. We have reduced the participation of women by 50 percent. We've done it three times and we have never recovered from any one of those. And we'd like to say, oh, well, that's surely not our fault. And I don't see why we have any basis for assuming it's not our fault. We seem to, so that, that's to say we need to be really careful how we handle and I know you're keeping the participation in your undergraduate program very constrained. That does not come for free. There was another question. So you're talking a lot about like, um, like digitization, change, like changing society potentially, and you were talking a lot in your talk about uh, the multidisciplinary nature of some of these, some of these topics. And I was wondering if you thought change the way they do, um, you know, instruction, so it's not based on, like, courseworks and, and majors and, and mm -hmm. you know, like, do you think it, the disruption is deep enough that universities would be able to change the way that they would actually, like, you know, engage in, with young people to you know, solve problems? Yeah, so maybe I can turn this into, if you could change one thing in the university, what would it be? <laughs> okay, so... Um, our organizational structure is a reflection of 1900s industrial manufacturing. Partition into divisions, into departments, specialize and differentiate. A tree. The realization is it ain't a tree, it's a graph. Okay, so if you could do one thing, it would be the cross edges, the fact that you have sharing, recognize those are the norm, not the exception, and that they should not be secondary. So if you just ask where you have shared purpose amongst distinct things, how do you make that be, in some sense, a first-class citizen? If that's all you do, it gets you a huge distance. Okay, it doesn't have to be, it's not that departments are bad or schools are bad because, you know, the other side of absolutely no structure. So let me give you a concrete example. So uh, you have a joint faculty member in two departments. What do we do? We create an MOU that says this is my half and this is your half. What happened to the reason that that particular individual represents both of us? We started a different kind of structure because we have a large number of joint that says, no, no, no. This is our half, i.e. 
a half of what you do is in the thing that we hold in common, such as our cross-listed courses or our shared programs. But we recognize that there are distinct needs that, ha that you don't care anything. So this is my quarter and your quarter. And now let's work out your teaching assignment on a two-year basis rather than a one-year basis so that you had four or six if you're on quarters. So that's a different mechanism that says we recognize the shared thing as having inherent value. And you can imagine applying that to your committee service and you know, other, you, you might apply it to space. So if you just said, it's a dag, it's not a tree. And all of those places, it's not that everything is connected to everything else, but something of in degree greater than one. It's very rare that it's greater than three. In fact, it's very rare that it's greater than two, but two is really good. And there's a reason for it, that that would be my, my one thing, is sharing good. Start with one. Yep. <laughs> okay, let's thank David for all his <laughs> openness and sharing us with his wisdom. Yeah, you can still talk to him, like we have a networking. <laughs> and for Rachel, a hand. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Awesome. Really good. Okay. That was fantastic. Okay. So we didn't get a chance to talk about research, but I think I accidentally rediscovered everything you did 10 years ago last summer. Oh, there you go. 